So thank you all for joining us today for our April events release webinar. My name is Adam Kiebeck. For those who have not met me before, I'm the customer support manager for events. And if you haven't seen me recently, I went on paternity leave. So we had a healthy daughter. Her name is Shazia. She was born on December 30th. I'm happy to be back with you guys. Okay, let's get started with our release notes. So please notice we have a new upgrade notice starting with our June 2021 release. We will require all customers to be no more than three versions behind the latest version. We'll start reaching out to customers this month, April, if you are more than three versions behind. Also, I'm sure some of you guys have already upgraded your orgs, but please make sure to review all prior release notes if you're skipping release notes. And also please first try upgrading and testing your sandbox first. That helps you test and address any bugs before pushing that update to production. And last but not least, we have some major breaking changes for this new release. The first, and sorry, before I jump in, anyone have questions before we get started? Awesome. So the first breaking change is that the description field on the event group will now work properly. If you are using that field internally as a descriptor or just storing text, please make sure to review your event groups as that text will now show up on your live event groups. And I'll show you how that works live. So let's navigate to one of our event groups. We'll go into Connected University. You'll see this description field here. We can add in text there. So let's say, please find our latest events below. I'll make that bold and I'll change the color because it is rich text. Try that again. There we go. So we'll click save. Now let's go to our event group. Do a hard refresh. You'll see at the top of that event group, that's where you find that help text. Any questions on that breaking change? Adam, that makes sense. Are you going to be at, uh, using the image that's available in the event group as well at some point? That is a good question. Let me. Can you actually drop that, Kevin, into the chat group so at the end of this I can take all questions? Sure. Yeah, I'll do that. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you. So the next breaking change is another big one. The redirect URL field on the event will now automatically redirect users to that defined URL when they check out for your event. So once they check out, pay for registration, it will automatically redirect them to that URL. Previously, it would take your attendee to a confirmation page. They would click done, and then that would redirect. Now that's automatic redirection, and I'll show you how that works. And first, since I am in my demo org, I want to remove that help text that we added. And we'll go into one of my events. And for those who are not familiar, we have this field called post registration. If you have redirect to URL as the dropdown, that this will impact your events. So redirect to URL and not show success message. And we have that redirect URL right here. So now let's go in and register for that event. We'll go to checkout, fill in all the payment information. What did I miss? So 
Sorry, my internet's on vacation. There we go. So now you'll see it automatically takes you to that redirect URL instead of landing me on the confirmation page and then clicking done. Any questions on this? Yes, I have a question, Adam. Um, it looks like if you do that, uh, go straight to the thank you page or whatever, um, the you redirect to the URL, you're going to lose the opportunity for the add to calendar. Is that correct? Is there that any way to back? That is correct. So the only place, so I'll be able to do the add to calendar from my attendee link. So you are losing that confirmation page with the add to calendar, but for my email, if I click in, here's my, this link might be broken. This email is broken, but if I go into my, if your email has your attendee link once they register, and I open that attendee link URL, I can still add the calendar from the attendee link. Okay, so um, when do you send them that email? Is that- um, That's the confirmation email once I register. So it looks like the email is broken in my demo org. When attendee registers, we have that workflow that sends them that email, thank you for registering. And I have the attendee link included in that email. I see. And the attendee link gives them the ad calendar and all the details. Exactly. Or okay. and if it's a webinar, then they'll have the join URL here. Right, right. Okay, that's the, what we need to do then. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no problem. And if you need any help setting that um, setting that up, feel free to submit a case at community.blackthorn.io if you run into any issues. Okay, thanks. No problem. Any is there also questions? the ability to redirect to the URL from the confirmation page? I think the done button sends me right back to the event. That done button will take you to the redirect URL. Oh, but from the confirmation page. So when you're when the the user is front end registering for the event, um, if I have a URL, it bypasses that confirmation page, but yeah, if I want to have release, the submission, it will bypass. so there's no way to redirect from the submission confirmation page. I can check on that. I, I don't believe with the latest release, what you could have is have a success message and include the redirect link in there as a workaround. If that makes sense, but if you, can you please post that comment in the chat as well? And I'll make sure to follow up on all of these questions that we're not able to address now. Sure. Thanks. Thank you. Any other questions on that? I know that's a major change if you are using the redirect URL. So next we fix several UI bugs with our, when viewing events on mobile. So first one, the event image and the event name will now render properly. Before it was cut off, if it was too long, we've adjusted that. So you have the proper event image, the title shows properly. And also, if you go into the calendar and select a particular date, we have all those events grouped by ongoing for that date. Any questions on that for those who are using mobile with their events? Our last breaking change it will impact any customers orgs that are using data dictionary to override free verbiage on their event group, their event, or events that have both paid and free ticket items. So let me show you the data dictionary entry first, and then I'll show you how that impacts the live events and event group. So let's go into one of my events. Just a quick show of hands. Do we have current customers on the call that are using our data dictionary to override the free verbiage? Awesome. What do you Thank you. Free verbiage. So let's also, actually, that's a good question. Let me open up my event and I'll show you that works before I go into the data dictionary. So on the event, we have for verbiage. So free and paid tickets available. That's if your event has both free and paid tickets. We also have verbiage that you can override for an event that's just free. So let me actually switch this calendar view to make it a little more user-friendly. So 
I'm going to switch that to list view so we can show all of our events. Sorry, just taking a little while to load. My internet's slow today. Okay. So on the event group, I've overridden where it says free to show free ticket option. And that's if my event has a free and paid ticket option instead of saying free and, and paid events. Or I might have a free event. That would say free here, but I've overridden that with the data dictionary entry to say free event instead. The last part, if I click into that free event, there's a separate data dictionary entry for the actual event listing. Anywhere it says free, I've overridden that value to say this event is free. Did that make sense? Did I answer that question? And then I'll show you how that works in the back end with the data dictionary. So we'll go into our event setting. We'll click into our data dictionary group. I created one called free where I'm overriding all the free labels on the event, the event group. And let's click in and edit. So LBL free, that overrides the free values on the event. If you wanna override the free language or verbiage on any event group, you need to use this new key called LBL underscore free underscore cap. And then this overrides the free and paid event language on the event group. So I overrode free to say free ticket option. Any questions on that and these new data, data dictionary entry terms? And this is for anyone that was using the LBL, or sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna ask if that's all updated on that Google doc that you all have. That you yes, all it should be on the Google doc, yep. Okay. So this only impacts those users that have free data dictionary entry overrides in their data dictionary. Any questions on these three new data dictionary entries? I guess the only question I have is when will these be active? These are active as of our front end release yesterday. Okay. Any questions on these breaking changes before we walk through our newest feature? Awesome. So we have one new feature with this latest release. We now support TouchNet for customers using a TouchNet account. A show of hands, is anyone on the call actually using TouchNet right now? Awesome. So for those who are not familiar, if you're using TouchNet to simplify your payment solutions, we now support TouchNet as a checkout for our one-stop shop experience. And I'll show you how that works. So if you're using TouchNet, you can now use TouchNet Payment Gateway with your events. So I'll go into my TouchNet example. You'll see my pay payment gateway is TouchNet. If you're using TouchNet and you're adding a payment gateway for TouchNet, you'll need to make sure you add a dropdown value for provider on the payment gateway for TouchNet. There's also several new fields that you have to add that are not part of our managed package. It's the T-Link URL, the UPay site ID, the UPay site URL, and the UPay form, U, UPay form parameters. So that's all done in our back office. Those fields and that provider value need to be manually added. We also have some detailed documentation here that walks through the setup. So as a quick overview for requirements, you must have a dedicated TouchNet UPay site connected to Blackthorn with a properly configured UPay site. And the following information is required to configure that TouchNet payment gateway. The T-Link service URL, the UPay site ID, and the UPay site URL. Those were the fields that I showed you that we had it to add to the payment gateway object. Also, once you've completed the setup in Salesforce, please go ahead and submit a case to our support team so we can finish setting you up with access to TouchNet. 
We already talked through adding the value for the payment provider, adding several new fields to the gateway. After that's done and we set you up with TouchNet on our end, you can then prepare TouchNet for Blackthorn on, on the TouchNet side. So we have detailed steps here as well for setting that up. Some more helpful information. What is supported? Only our events checkout is supported. We also support the ability to pass a department to the T-Link endpoint. And what is not supported? Webhooks, virtual terminal, Salesforce refunds or charges, and PayLink and document link. So let's show you how this works live. So I'll go into my test event that's using TouchNet. So we'll go through registration, we'll add our attendee and we'll go to checkout. So once I click complete, this will actually take you to our TouchNet um, checkout. So that's where I can now enter my test credit card information. So on our release notes, we have some test credit card information you can test with. So we'll do Visa. And the code is 125. And there is an active bug for this regarding the redirect right now that's blocking this registration. We do have a hotfix planned. I need to get an update on when that'll be working. But if you do run into this issue, please submit a support case. But once I check out, I get the confirmation screen. I should get a confirmation email, like the following. Let me just drag my inbox over so I can show you the example. And that's that confirmation email once I paid and checked out using that new TouchNet payment gateway. Any questions on this for anyone that is using TouchNet? Awesome. So next, there's several front end enhancements that I want to walk through. First, when the waitlist capacity field is set to no on event item, there will now be an unlimited waitlist capacity. If you don't have any capacity for waitlisting, you no longer have to set a value for that. So let's show you that live. So we'll go into Adam's conference. We'll scroll down to our waitlisting fields. You see waitlist is enabled. We don't have a capacity, it's null. And my event should be sold out. Let's make sure. Yep, so remaining capacity is zero. So now if I navigate to that event, I can join the waitlist. I did not have to set a capacity on that. Any questions on that enhancement? Awesome. So the next enhancement, when there are no events listed on your event group, we should saw a message that said there's no available content at the moment. Please come back later. We've now made that more granular and more informa uh, better information for your end users that says there are no upcoming events. So let's show you how that works. <clears throat> so I'll click into one of my event groups. We'll go into one of our event groups that has no active events. Let's open that event group. Now you see this new error message. Any questions on that? Does that work for all your embedded URLs as well? Correct, yep. Okay. So next, for those that are using our calendar event group UI, this now shows events scheduled on that specific date. So I go if I go into the calendar, click a date, instead of showing all of my events, it now drills down to that specific date. So let's show you that live as well. So we'll go into our connected university. We'll change it from UI experience from list to calendar. So 
Let's go to a month where I have multiple dates. I think that's November. Yep. So now we'll click in, let's click into the 23rd. It only shows those two events for that date. Same thing if I click into the 20th or the 10th. Any questions on that? So a next new enhancement, which I'm pretty excited about, is the favicon URL. You can now change the favicon that appears on your events. So there's a new field called favicon URL on the event setting. And if we click into the event setting documentation, we have some more information on this. So you can add a URL to the favicon URL field on the event setting that will link to a branded favicon of your choosing. So instead of showing our out of the box Blackthorn B, you can change it to any image of your choice. Please note the default sizing for the favicon is 16 by 16 pixels. And I'll show you how this works live as well. So let's go into our one of our events. And we'll click into the event setting. There's a field called favicon URL. So I have this custom branded logo that I'm adding. Now let's show you how that works on our live event. Let's click into our event. Now you can see that favicon is no longer that Blackthorn B. Any questions on that one? And again, that's set at the event setting level and applies to all of the events tied to that event setting. All right. So next we'll go into our backend enhancements. This is a pretty big enhancement that I'm excited about. I know a number of customers have been having issues with publishing and caching for our events. So we now have a new lightning component called BT events published that allows for easy control of publishing and updating any changes made to your event. This really eliminates the need to do a hard refresh. Hopefully people are excited about this. Let's go into our event. Please note, this is a new lightning component that you have to add to your page layout. So while you can still use this publish button, which actually will just mark the um, event visible versus non-visible as we've specified in our release notes here. But we also have this widget now where I can cl click right here, unpublish that event, boom, that's done. I can also just click into publish. Boom, that event's live and published. Also, what I'm really excited about is this update button here. This really eliminates the need to do any hard refresh when you're updating your event. So say we wanna update the end date for this event. Let's change that to 124. And let's do update. This will be a real-time update, no need to do a hard refresh. Now, if I open that event URL, that end date has been modified in real time, no hard refresh needed. Let's try another update. Let's change this from Oak tabbed to Redwood Smart. And let's click update. And let's refresh the browser. Boom, that UI change in real time, no hard refresh needed. Any questions on this? I know this is a big change. I really hope this improves your publishing and caching issues that a couple of a number of our customers have been running into. Um, yeah, that's great. How did you get that to show up again? Great question. So on your layout, you want to have a system admin go in or anyone that has access to modify the back office settings. So I'll click edit page. Okay. And this will update your lightning, your lightning page layout. So let's search for event. BT event publish, just loading a little slow. But once you search for that, it should pop up here and then you can drag that component right here.
give it another half a minute. Same thing with this new email configuration component that I'll walk through a little bit as well. That will be need, that will need to be added to your payment or your page layout as well. Sorry, my internet's going a little slow, but did that answer your question? There we go. So the BT events publish, I can just drag uh, that. Uh, okay. Now add that component. And the same for um, the email thing. Yep, and that's BT. Um, BT email, what was it? A BT event email configuration. Uh, And then you'll just save that layout. My layout's already active in its default, but you might have to go through some settings where you set it as your org default, apply it to profiles and record types, if you haven't modified that out of the box layout. Did that answer your question? Um, I think so. Um, these emails, that we're adding, it, it's still the same thing where all the, any merge fields have to come from a single object, correct? That's a, is that a Salesforce thing? For the classic email templates, that's correct, but you could have a formula field. I think I had a case for this last week. You can have a formula field, say on the attendee that pulls in a field from the event. Okay, but- That would work. You just can't have the cross object references because that value will pull in blank. I see. Okay. Hi, I also have a question for this feature. Um, I don't know if anyone else has tried it already, but um, I tried it yesterday and then I got an error message saying that I don't have the permissions. And when I talked to my admin, he says it's not in the permissions rights. So, um, and this is something that you guys, um, Blackthorn guys have to fix. So I don't know if anyone else has tried and got the same message, so. Would you be able to submit a case for that so we can review that and make sure you're set up correctly? I'll do that. I just, I was just waiting for today. And so okay. I'll do that tomorrow. Yes, if you have the events permission set, you shouldn't be able to run into any issues, but if you can submit that case, we'll be able to review and further troubleshoot yeah, okay. if you can grant us access. Yeah, thanks. We'll do so. <laughs> Thank you. Any other question. questions on that? Oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so I do have a question. With the unpublished button, does that mean the event will still be active for um, you all to still use? Or does that mean it's deactivated that you can't do registration from? Because it just means it takes it from the web? Yeah, so I can show you that. Yep, so right now our event is active so that, that public URL is active. But if I go in and unpublish that, that event is no longer visible. So it's unpublished. Right, so it's, it's not available for the web to registration, but could you still do that as a manual registration in-house? Yes, correct, yep. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for that? And just to elaborate that, there's some help text for this one checked. So that button unchecks this or checks this publish button. So when check displays the event on the event link so that URL, when unchecked, the event link will not show the event information. So now you see that event is no longer active. It's no longer available to the public. Any other questions on that enhancement? Awesome. So next we added a process button to our form submission object to easily reprocess any forms that may have failed or resulted in error when submitting. In my demo org, I don't have any failed form submissions, but I'll show you where that button is and how it works. So we'll go to the app picker. We'll find our form submissions. We'll click into any of these form submissions. There's an actual button you'll have to add to your layout called process. So I'll click process, boom, that updates my form submission and fully processes that and the form submission answers. Any questions on that? I 
So next, we made a number of improvements and enhancements to our event wizard. We gathered your feedback. We made some improvements. We added some fun, groovy theme music. We added a back arrow, so you can go back and forth through the wizard. We've also added help text where appropriate. Additionally, we've added a save and publish button where you want your, your event to go live and be available for registration or say you added event items, but you still need to add attendees or add sessions. You're not ready to publish that event. You can do save and publish later. And I'll show you these enhancements live in shortly. Also, when adding a webinar account on the event wizard, the webinar meeting URL field will automatically populate with the URL. That means you no longer have to use this button here on the event if you're using the event wizard. And also we added the ability to add forms and form elements to the event wizard as well. Any questions on these enhancements before I show you them live? Okay. So we'll click in, we're on the events admin tab. We'll click into the event wizard. add in the event details here. We'll click next. And as you can see down here, we have the SoundCloud integration. So we have some fun music playing down here. I don't think you can hear it because I have my headphones in, but if you want to jam out while you're doing the event wizard, go for it. We also added this back button. So now you can navigate back and forth and make changes throughout all the tabs for the event wizard. Also, as I mentioned, we have the save and publish later where you save the event, but you have additional changes to make or save and publish now where your event's ready to go, ready to go live, boom, it's published. We also added help text, as I mentioned. So for the banner, suggested size is 820, 820 pixels by 410 pixels. There's some help text for the payment gateway contact us. So certain fields that require help text, are, they're now available. Let's also show you how to add in forms and form elements. So we'll go into the offers. Let's add our payment gateway. And we'll go in and add a new ticket. And here's where I can select from an existing form or I can create a new form. In this case, we'll do an existing form. And then we'll click next. You can also add attendees as well. So now let's do save and publish later. I'm not ready to push this event live yet. So you can see my event is not published yet. But now I can go in and click the wizard and open that event right up and begin where I left off. The last enhancements that, that I did not walk through is if you go to the detail page, you can now add that webinar account right from the wizard. So in this case, we wanna do a Zoom webinar. And then we can save and publish later or publish now. Any questions on those enhancements to our wizard? Awesome. And as you saw previously, we've added a new component labeled the BT event email configuration. This allows you to automatically schedule email templates to fire when attendee registers for an event, is added to a waitlist or removed from a waitlist, meaning they can now register for the event. We have some additional documentation here as well. So please note that new component does have to be added to your page layout as I showed you previously. And the three email templates that can trigger are when an attendee's registration status equals registered, set the confirmation email that will send, when the status is waitlisted, that waitlisted email will send, and when the attendee's registration status is waitlisted pending, the waitlisted pending email will send. And I'll show you how that works live. So let's go into one of our events. You'll see we have the email configuration component added to our layout. Let me find my confirmation email. And these are the templates that I've built or using the out-of-box templates in the email template builder. 
We'll do a, our test email for waitlisted email. And then for pending, I have another test one too. And we'll click save. Now those emails will automatically fire based on those attendee statuses. Any questions on those? So um, Adam, you don't have to do any, you know, workflow rules or email alerts with this, correct? Ex great you question. You can do it exactly. all from within Blackthorn. Exactly. You no longer have to use those Salesforce workflows because we've added that flexibility within the app. Okay. I guess the only thing is you're not going to get your receipt information, correct? This way, like, you know, the credit card last four and the date all that sorry say that again well i'm just thinking that you know if you want to if your confirmation normally includes the receipt uh, information you know the card holder and the, the last four digits of the card and you know so you should still have that separate email for that that sales document and the payment that still goes out this will just so be that registration confirmation I see that says you're registered and then yeah, exactly. you have to send a second one with the actual receipt is what you're saying. Exactly. I see. Okay. Or modify your template to include all within the one template. Is that, if that makes sense? Is that possible though to include all that in there? You know, the attendee name and, and the transaction and the card holder and the credit card information? Right. Not in the email template builder because it's using the the child objects, but you could do that in with a visual force email template pulling in those child records. But out of the box, you could have this confirmation email then use their out of the box email that goes out for payment confirmation. Okay. Just just checking on that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. No problem. Any other questions on that component? Also next, if for those that are using reoccurring events, we've added toast messages when generating and, can and using the cancel buttons for reoccurring events. So you'll get a successful toast message that appears anytime you generate or cancel your reoccurring events. So let's show you how that works. So let's go into our recurring events. We'll make a brand new recurring event. I'll schedule this to draft status so we can actually click that generate button. I'll do keep one open. We'll clone event items and sessions. We'll find our event template that we want to use for these recurring events. And I'll set them to scheduling daily. We'll do four days in a row. So the first event will start tomorrow. And then end tomorrow as well. So we'll click save and we'll click generate. Once I click generate, you should get that toast message that says successful. So these recurring events were generated. Same thing now if I go in and cancel. So I want to cancel these four reoccurring events. So I'll click cancel and I'll get that toast message as well. Any questions from anyone that's using our reoccurring event functionality for that? All right. Next, for those that want to easily report on their attendees and all of their answers, we've now added a new out of the box report labeled form submission answers. And I'll walk through that live. So we'll go into reports. And we'll click new report. Form submission answers. Let's say I want to drill this report down to a specific event. So I want to do this Dunder Mifflin Golf Tournament. So let's add a filter. So we want to show all form submissions. And we want the event name. So that's Dunder Mifflin Golf Tournament Fundraiser. And then for our outline, let's add in, we'll add in the attendee name. 
let's add in their answer. So now you can see I have a report of all form submissions for my golf event, along with the attendee full name and their answers. You can pull in any fields from the answers and the form submission. Any questions on using this new report type? And if I want to add in question as well, that might be helpful. So now you can see the actual question and the answer. Last but not least, for those using our events component within your Salesforce community, we've now added the ability to change the language when viewing events in the community. Any questions on the enhancements and features before we walk through some notable bug feature or bug fixes? Awesome. So for front end bug fixes, we walk through the description on the event group. So please make sure to check your event groups that have values in that description field. We've also corrected an issue where when attendee is choosing a country from the phone pick list on event, all the number values and flags are now correct. So I can show you that live real quick. So click get tickets. When I select my phone number, now the flags and the phone and the numbers are correct. We've also fixed an issue with the simple UI where previously attendees were unable to select which state they lived in as the, as the field was missing on the registration form. So we have now fixed that for the simple UI. We've also fixed an issue where the language selector was not appearing on the simple UI as well. That has been fixed. Data dictionary, data dictionary values now work for post-event surveys as well. So if you're sending out post-event surveys and using data dictionary, that feature now works. Also another big issue that we've resolved is when the sales end date was in the past, Users were noticing that they were still able to register for an event. We've updated the app logic to show a closed banner, and we've also removed the registration button for any event with a sales end date in the past. So let me show you on the event. Scroll down a little bit, and you'll see this sales end date and time. If that is in the past, that completed banner will show and no one will be able to register for that event. Any questions on that one? Because I know that bug was reported by a number of our customers. All right. Also for those using uh, Salesforce community and person accounts, when attendee is registering for an event as a person account, it will now show their email with the add myself. So that will actually function correctly in the community now. Next, we talked about the redirect URL. So we fixed an issue where the redirect URL, that end user had to click done to navigate to that redirect page. Now that will directly navigate to that redirect URL when that person registers and checks out. Another uh, notable bug that was fixed was the cancel registration button was disappearing from the attendees attendee link. This has now been fixed. And I, we, I believe we've reported this back to every customer that reported that issue. But if you're still running to that issue, please reach out to us, but this should now be resolved. Also, for those using the Redwood UI, we fixed two bugs with this. The correct time zone for the event will now show. And also we're displaying the date in the correct format for events with the German language selected. So anyone that's using the uh, Redwood UI, these two items have been fixed. Last but not least for our front end fixes, when creating full and partial sandboxes, the event URL will now automatically update according to the new org ID. And to wrap up, oops, to wrap up, we have a couple of backend bug fixes. So first, when cloning events, there would previously be an error when using the following fields, 
Attendee count last updated and canceled before time. You no longer should see that error when cloning events. Also, for those using big list groups, the record ID will no longer be populated. Instead, the option value will be populated when mapping your answers to the attendee contact leader account. So if you have a big list question on your form and you're mapping that value to any of your records like the attendee, that value will now show as the option value and not the record ID. Another big fix was our campaign event sync was sporadically failing. This has now been switched to asynchronous process to resolve any further issues. Please note this may take a few moments for that campaign and event sync data to populate. Another update or bug fix for our campaign and event sync was that when a user did not have access to the lead object, they will now be able to create attendees through the campaign and event sync feature. They no longer have to have access to the lead object. Our last notable backend bug fix was there were instances where form submission answers were failing. If a form submission had multiple related records, this meant none of the fields were being mapped to your attendee, contact, or lead. This logic has been updated so that it's a queuable process and now able to process all of the records that do not fail and skip those that do fail. So instead of failing all mappings, the records that do pass will update your mapped attendee, contact, or lead. Any questions? I know we went through a number of features, back end, front end enhancements, and bug fixes. Any questions with our last 10 minutes? Awesome. Well, thank you guys for joining us. I have one uh, question from Kevin for updating event groups to use the logo URL and another name. I don't want to mispronounce is it Marie Chris. Mary Chris, very close. Okay, good. <laughs> I want to make sure this. Yeah, no problem. And I'll follow up with the redirect URL to see if there's still an option to have the done button like you had previously. Any other questions, concerns, or for regarding this latest release before we call it a day. Um, well, thank you guys. Oh, so go ahead, Peggy. Well, I was just going to ask on your screen, you've got that events wizard. You can have a lot more buttons than we have. And how are you, are those all things you have to add to the settings, like the events wizard button, for example? Correct. Yep. And I can show you these you want to add to your layout. So let's go into. You can see my screen right now, correct? No. Okay. No. Um, I can. Sure. Or wait a minute. Okay. What about okay. now? Yeah. 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 Okay. Awesome. So we'll go in instead of editing page, which I showed earlier to add the lightning components, we'll do edit object. And we'll go to our page layout. And then I want to go to page layout assignment to see which layouts are active and which ones we're using. So in this org, let me find the record type for this. So we have a complex event. If you have multiple record types and multiple layouts, you wanna make sure you go into each of those layouts and modify them. But in this case, I'm only modifying my complex layout. And that's the event layout. So I'll click into that. And then under my lightning experience actions, that's where I can add the wizard button or the create webinar meeting button or that send email that sends emails using our new email template builder. Right. So under mobile and lightning actions, you can just search for those actions and then drag and drop. Okay, so mobile and lightning actions, okay. And if you're using classic, you would just use the buttons right here, but I'm, I'm assuming most people are using lightning. Thank you. No problem. Any other questions? Well, thank you guys. We will be posting this recording on our release notes. So that should be updated within the next couple of days. And if you have any questions or run into any issues with upgrading, please reach out via our community. And for those who are not familiar, all of our support requests should be coming through our community. 
So you just click create a case and that will route to the right team. So feel free to submit any, if you run into any issues or need any support, please reach out to us. And thank you guys and have a great rest of the week.